Excellencies and Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests and Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. Today, I welcome you all to our roundtable discussion with the title, Turbulence in the Middle East, Understanding the Implication. The moderator for our today's roundtable is Major General A.N.A. Munirul Zaman, MDC, PSC, President Bips. And the expert panelists for today are Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhary, Distinguished Fellow at BIPS and former Foreign Advisor to the Government of Bangladesh. And our second panelist is Assistant Professor Parvis Karim Abbasi from the Department of Economics, East West University. Now, I would like to request the moderator to continue with the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you and assalamu alaikum. It is a distinct pleasure for me again to welcome you this morning to BIPS Roundtable that we hold every month. And this month is on a very important topic about the Middle East and we are essentially focusing on the Gaza crisis. We have a distinguished panel to discuss these issues today. And as you heard, we have Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhary, and Mr. Pervez Karim Abbasi. Our third speaker was Brigadier Shahidul Anam Khan, former editor of Daily Star. Unfortunately, he can't be present with us due to a personal tragedy at home. His wife passed away last week. So we all pray for the eternal peace of a soul. The crisis in Gaza is ongoing. It is a crisis in the Middle East that the, the world and the Middle East has never seen before. As of today, according to the Gaza Ministry of Health, over 14,300 Palestinians have been killed, of which over 6,000 are children. There are more than 29,400 Palestinians who are injured, and the equal numbers go on and on. The events of October 7, the attack by Hamas inside Israel, is the event that triggered the whole crisis. But the crisis is far deeper, and it has severe implications, not only on the Middle East, but on the international system as a whole. There are grave questions about a lot of ongoing strategic initiatives. How will they last after the crisis? Like the question of, of launching of IMAC, for example, or the sustainability of the Abraham Accord in the Middle East. The ongoing data that was initiated by some powers between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So that hangs on the balance. So there are several issues that have severe implications from the current crisis. We shall be discussing most of these issues in depth with our panelists and then come back to you for your questions and comments. But while discussing this from the floor and from the panel, I shall request all of you so that we refrain from making any statement that hurts any religious feeling or feeling of any particular group by name. We are here to discuss things objectively and not emotionally. So I shall request you to follow those guidelines. With that very brief introduction, may I now start with our first panelist, Dr. Iftakar Ahmed Chaudhary. Dr. Chaudhary, you have the floor for the next 15 minutes. Thank you, moderator. Well, I, I, I too am very saddened uh, by, uh, by the loss uh, of uh, a designated speaker, uh, his wife, uh, Brigadier General uh, Anam. Um, uh, she, I knew Ayman Aftar Banu, his, her, his wife, uh, many, many years ago. We were students together, we were teenagers in, at the university. Uh, she was a, a very vibrant personality, uh, a spark that would light the 
uh, uh, the hearts and minds of uh, all her friends. She came of a very distinguished uh, literary family of Bangladesh, uh, Professor Munir Chaudhary, sister Professor Munir Chaudhary, Kabir Chaudhary, uh, Firdosi, Majumdar, and, and, and the rest. One of my great regrets is that uh, since those days, I had not been able to see her because of my travels. And, uh, uh, and yet, uh, I do feel the void. So I do fervent, fer fervently join you in prayers uh, for her, uh, for the solace of her soul. Well, uh, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Middle East, particularly Palestine. Now, there, there is a medieval uh, <clears throat> uh, Latin cry of soldiers as they rushed into battle. Uh, it went, Mors tua vita mia. Broadly translated, it means, you must die so that I might live. This saying appears <clears throat> to be forever apt for the Middle East. Ever since I became inter intellectually curious about international relations, which was practically since my childhood, one of the most frequent phrases that I was exposed to was, the Middle East is in turmoil. Why is it so? And why was it so? And what is the core problem? Undoubtedly, it is Palestine. And it has been for the annals of, uh, of, of uh, the Middle East. Its thread appears, uh, appears to run through much of its history, from the Crusades uh, between the Christians and Muslims uh, to the contemporary conflict between Arabs and the Jews. The irony is that despite being the slice of geography that gave birth to all the Abrahamic faiths, uh, each of which uh, uh, preached peace, or said they did, uh, this has remained man's most violent battleground. It becomes increasingly difficult to ignore the warning in the New Testament that this will also be the scene of the final Armageddon. Last week, uh, I, I spoke at a book club uh, that I belong to here, where we discussed the Pulitzer Pri Prize winning uh, novella called Minor Detail. Now, this was by a Palestinian writer named Adriana Shibley. The book belonged to what we call a uh, resistance genre in, uh, 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 in literature. It had two parts. The first, a true story of a young Bedouin woman captured, raped, and killed by a group of Israeli soldiers in the Negev desert in 1948. The second, uh, now the, the, this, the first part provided a laconic view of a sordid crime. In the second part, decades later, a Palestinian journalist courageously sets out to comprehend the senseless event, and she meets a similar senseless end at the very same spot of occurrence. Nothing had changed uh, in the long intervening period in terms of the odium of occupation, uh, the normalization of injustice, and the degradation of character. The author called her book Minor Detail. Minor Detail because, uh, I, I mean, this is a, polit uh, a tellingly political axiom because she argues that major details uh, fall prey to the forgery and fabrication of the powerful, whereas the minor details, the series of small incidents she recounts, survives as testimonies of truth. This piece of literature is a mix of fact and fiction, but tells the story of the pains of Palestine better than a dozen textbooks. 
Before focusing on the current crisis, a quick recap of the Arab-Israeli peace process may be in order. The cycle of wars we have uh, uh, witnessed since 1948, also, by the way, called the Nakba, which in Arabic means uh, catastrophe, catastrophe because of the, the, the defeat of the, the Arabic, Arab armies. 1948, uh, uh, 56, uh, 67, 73, uh, etc. All these deepened the stalemate and Palestine. The Americans and the Soviets got into the act towards the fag end of the Cold War. And under their auspices, the Madrid Peace Conference held in, was held in 1991. It brought together Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and the Palestinians, encouraging, and this is what the Madrid uh, conference did, encouraging uh, 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 bilateral contacts between the parties. Norway served as a conduit between the Israelis and, and, and Palestinians, which led to the Oslo Accord of September uh, 1993. Uh, I knew one of the Sherpas, who wasn't a Sherpa, he, he was actually in a lead role, uh, Terry Rod Larsen, who was foreign minister of Nor Norway, and later became a deputy prime minister, and we exchanged many views on, on, on the Oslo Accords at that point in time and thereafter. Uh, it, uh, both sides agreed that the Palestinian Authority would be established, and it would be governing uh, responsibilities in the West Bank and Gaza Strip over a five-year period. And thereafter, the, uh, the permanent status talks on the issues of borders, refugees, and Jerusalem would be held. The Oslo Accord was an exercise in gradualism that was doomed to failure. The dispute over the status of Jerusalem and the arrival on the scene uh, in Israel of the right-wing uh, power, uh, of, of particularly of Benjamin Netanyahu. By the way, I mean, we were also together uh, in, in New York uh, as DPRs. Uh, uh, in Netanyahu later became PR and I remained DPR, but, but eventually went to the post later. Uh, that speeded up the process of failure. Now, Israeli domestic politics led the government to encourage settlement in the Arab lands, particularly in and around the West Bank. There, the Palestinian Authority presented a weaker profile than the more radic ra radical Hamas, which eventually controlled Gaza. I'm just giving a very quick recap of, 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 of the uh, uh, backdrop. Arab governments seem to want to establish uh, linkages with Israel rather than back the Palestinian Authority in their cause. Indeed, even Saudi Arabia, largely viewed as the leader of the Arab world, was on the verge, verge of reaching an agreement with Israel following the Abraham Accords that you, 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 you spoke about. It is stopping this that some say lay at the root of the Hamas attack on 7th October. Since then, as you have heard, we have been witnessing a disproportionate and relentless uh, uh, loss of uh, reaction on the part of Israel that has lost uh, led to the loss of the thousands of lives that uh, you have mentioned, moderator. And uh, as, the, uh, as much of the world stood dismayed and even deterred, calls for a two-state solution supported by countries like Bangladesh, uh, with Palestine and, and Israel living side by side uh, with, uh, with, without opposition or occupation, in consonance with UN uh, resolutions, seem to be falling on deaf ears. And no, no end to death and destruction appears to be in sight. Even the United States, 
still very much the anchor nation in the international system, despite all these talk of, 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 of uh, multipolarism. America still remains and will remain for a long time to come a significant player in the, in the global scene because of its military, military and economic power. America is unable to support, was unable to support a ceasefire, although, uh, which is normally the first step towards ending a conflict because of domestic political situation. Recently, uh, former President Carter has said that the persecution in Palestine transcends what any outside mind can imagine. And he said, there are powerful forces that that preclude, pre uh, prevent an objective uh, an analysis of this situation because of which over the last seven years, no peace talks have taken place. Uh, now, uh, you see, the uh, indeed the complexities uh, of the Middle Eastern politics may have been, and this is just a thought, may have been the principal reason for President Obama's famous tilt to uh, Asia Pacific. This created a void in the Middle East where the complexities of the Middle Eastern po politics might have had uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 occasion to play out. Uh, so what had happened was, just as in physics, and nature hates a vacuum in politics as well. Ironically, the supposed target of America's tilt to Asia Pacific, China, China now moved to fill the void in the Middle East with Russia's support, as President Putin himself was unable to play any significant role uh, due to the Ukraine war. We saw China broker Iran and Saudi Arabia and thereafter focus on the Palestinian issue with Councillor Wang Yi now in the driver's seat. A tad late, but not too late uh, though, America has readjusted as demonstrated by the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, shuttle Blinken's, uh, Secretary Blinken's shuttle diplomacy. There is also a compulsion in President Biden's according weightage to values, to values in international politics. In other words, values to American policy, uh, for American foreign policy in, in the international sphere, values such as human rights being one of them. Uh, the rest of the Western world is also under pressure to reset course. Uh, President Emmanuel Macron of France uh, has said that uh, he hoped Western leaders would join his call for ceasefire, uh, cease uh, and uh, he included the leaders in, in Washington as well. Uh, even in the, uh, and also note the sentiments uh, emanating from, in Europe, from say countries like uh, Spain and, and Norway at this point in time. Uh, for uh, in, even in the English speaking world, uh, London witnessed a massive demonstration that shook British politics and led to the dismissal, as we know, of the Home Secretary by the Prime Minister. Now, I'm not suggesting that Palestine will st uh, start a global conflict, but it has most certainly touched the politics of nations. At the end, it was left to Qatar to mediate the deal for the exchange of prisoners between Hamas and Israel. Now, uh, uh, just as a footnote, I should like to add that another feature of uh, in, uh, the development in, in, in politics of the Gulf and in, uh, in Middle East generally has been the rise of little Qatar, once considered Anfa Tarib, the terrible child of, of, uh, of, of uh, Middle Eastern politics. Uh, I spent some years in Qatar as ambassador those days, and the very bright young foreign minister there, Sheikh Hamad bin uh, Jasim bin Jabbar al Thani, uh, he was uh, 
in, in, the, in, in, the, in the lead in framing a foreign policy of, for Qatar to match its resources and unmatch its size, to, so to say. And from those days, and that was almost three decades ago, we see Qatar play the role that it is doing in the global politics, and certainly in the Middle East and beyond at this point in time. So what is to be done? Are we to believe that just because there is a problem, and the Torah actually says that just because there is a problem, there, there is not necessarily a solution. Or are we to uh, 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 think that the idea of land for peace as proffered by the by resolution uh, 242 of, of the United Nations Security Council is, is, uh, is, is dead? In fact, uh, 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 one of my professors, uh, uh, Steve Rosen, he's of Israeli or origin, he, he had worked out an extremely intricate uh, details of the application of the resolution, which he called a piece of peace, a piece of land for a piece of peace. However, uh, the Middle East, still remains a battlefield for pro proxy wars between the big powers. Today, the world is bristling with deadly weaponry. Any miscalculation could lead to incalculable disaster. Given the passions on all sides, key logic clearly dictates it makes saner sense to leave it to the extent possible to the global community to act. And this is my thesis in this presentation. The United Nations has adequate tools uh, in, in its hands to do so. I refer to the principle of responsibility to protect, or R2P, as it is known in short, adopted by world leaders at the United Nations in 2005. I was privileged to have assisted in crafting it as a, as a facilitator uh, of the chair, which was the president of the General Assembly. R2P was designed to prevent four types of humanitarian crises. One, genocide. Two, war crimes. Third, ethnic cleansing. And four, Crime, crimes against humanity. It is based on the norm that sovereignty requires, and this is higher politics, sovereignty requires a responsibility to protect all population for, from such crisis, that no state is really sovereign in that sense. I mean, if you are to follow global club rules, you have to act accordingly. If a country is unable or uh, or unwilling to do so, in other words, unable or unwilling to uh, to protect a part of its population, then the responsibility would devolve on the international community. Of course, it does not apply imply automatic UN military uh, intervention. The basic tenets of R2P also includes measures such as mediation, diplomatic cooperation, and economic sanctions all under UN aegis as a part, uh, uh, as a part of mechanism so that sovereignty is respected in, uh, within a certain country. The primary uh, purpose of the intervention is thus to halt and avert human suffering. Now, the UN Special Rapporteur uh, for Occupied Territories, Francesco Albanese, uh, she's an Italian legal expert, has univocally asserted that the, uh, that the Palestinians are involved in an existential struggle in their historic homeland. They are at great danger of ethnic cleansing. Now, if uh, by which he meant uh, intentional targeting of a people based on, uh, on, I mean, this is the definition, national, ethnic, and religious lines with the aim of destroying it in all or some of its parts. Her reports would or could justify the invocation of, uh, uh, in, uh, of R2P in the case of Palestine. Now, this is not a proposition, nor even a suggestion. It is just an idea. But 
an idea uh, which, uh, as Victor Hugo once said, idea whose time has come. As, uh, as I said, I had some dec decades ago served as ambassador in, in the Gulf. And there I had, uh, that was many years ago, and made some notes. The purpose was to eventually write my memoirs, which alas is still a glint in the eye. <laughs> but I, I, I uh, uh, would like to call it, uh, my dear foreign secretary dispatches from, from, uh, from Doha. My dear foreign secretary is an expression by which in the British Commonwealth, ambassadors usually address the foreign office. Now, so in these notes, and I self quote, uh, which I was looking through while I was prepping for, for this event today, I found this from my own writings. These sheikhdoms in, in the Gulf are by definition oligarchical because of a vast majority of population in each comprise uh, expatriates. Their capacity to govern and control themselves seem challenged in many ways. Policy making is often subject to external pressure. This is rendered easier by the fact that a small coterie of ruling families are to be manipulated to exercise control. Some basic features of a modern state are often lacking. The national populations are not distinct from one another in culture, language, religion, ethnicity, or human exper or historical experience. Their borders are ill-defined, often lines drawn on the sand by former colonials, utterly ignored by shifting Bedouin tribes. Their governments cannot develop the, their resources oil and gas without outside help. Their wealth is exogenous and not a product of human endeavor. Their people do not always like this and show disapproval, oftentimes violently. The extrapolation is therefore that the outer shells of these states are severely stra uh, strained and soft. As a result, they may be easily penetrated. Sovereignty, therefore, is under perennial threat. This conclusion is only my hypothesis, but one that I shall be happy if proved wrong. Back to the crisis in Palestine. An apt end to my remarks would be the reminder uh, to, uh, of the biblical par parable asserting that power does not necessarily reside with the mighty. The seemingly large and mighty Goliath was felled by an apparently smaller and weaker David by a single pebble shot from his sling. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for your wonderful presentation. I was also struck by the invoking of the idea of applying R2P. Perhaps this could be an excellent case for R2P. Of all the conditions that we see in Gaza and Palestine, Perhaps the most striking thing to me is the humanitarian crisis that is ongoing there. I will not go through the numbers, but I can also say that the complete breakdown of the health system, this lack of food, this lack of water, this lack of medicine, children being denied medical help, 50,000 Palestinian women in Gaza without medical help today. So it is a humanitarian crisis of untold proportions. Such is a crisis that the UN Secretary General has called, this is the graveyard for the children, because over 6,000 children have died in a span of few weeks. It is a case in which Bangladesh has always stood with our brothers in Palestine. 
for the just causes. And I also see that under the leadership of South Africa, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Comoros, and Djibouti has now referred the case of Israel's disproportionate use of force on Palestine people to the ICC. And it is a case that is now pending before the ICC after the referral in which Bangladesh also has taken an initiative. <coughs> this is a international crisis that will lay the pathways to many future crises in the world. And that is why it is very important for us to analyze and understand the crisis in depth. I shall now go to our next panelist, Pervez. You will have the floor for the next 15 minutes. Yeah. No, thank you. Apologies. Uh, still good morning. Uh, Sla Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor. And it is always rather problematic to come second after such an elegant and erudite speaker like Dr. Iftikhar Chaudhary. But I also believe in the principle of R to I, right to inform. So I will be objective. I'll give you information which you may or may not know. And then I leave the analysis part to, to your own individual capabilities. Let me start with three things. Three words, one from Hebrew and two from Arabic. And because it's apropos, because again, uh, if you talk about the Middle East, you cannot start but uh, without referring to the Israel-Palestinian crisis. One is Aliyah, the right to return to home, which Theodor Herzl again started or floated the idea in 1897 with far-ranging consequences, 1897. And that led to two Arabic words. One is Nakba, which is again catastrophe. And also because of this persistent suppression and denial of basic human rights and lack of justice, which could be dispensed from the international community across time, across political divide, intifada, which is again uprising. So these are the three words that will come to your mind over and over again. Again, a lot has been said about the Palestine-Israeli conflict, and I believe we have the Palestinian ambassador who will be speaking after me. So I will focus less on this Palestinian issue, but I, will fo but I will focus on certain aspects of Israel, which is not either known openly or not discussed, number one. And number two, what ramifications it has on the rest of the Middle East. Because again, the Middle East is also there besides Israel and Palestine. Now, the attack on Hamas of Hamas and Islamic Jihad operatives that took place after 16 years of open year siege, because remember, the Palestinian territories, one is again the West Bank, another one is basically Gaza. And it was the policy of the Likud party under Binyamin Netanyahu to undermine Palestine authority, to undermine the secular Arab credentials. And that's why they encouraged the rise of Hamas, the rise of Ikhwan Muslimin. And again, the idea was that Binyamin Netanyahu was much more comfortable dealing with Hamas because, again, they could present this extremist, violent, out of control Arab Muslim fanatics, which scares the West. The Palestine Authority is difficult. It's more suave. It's more used to international diplomacy. So in the West Bank, they carried out illegal expansion in the occupied territories. And in Gaza, they just forgot about this. In connivance with Egypt, who basically carried out a dual siege for 17 years. But the question that nobody is asking, what happened because of this attack? Because if you look into Israel, across history, if you take from the biblical times, Israel has been its own worst enemy. They need an existential enemy to focus their centrifugal tendencies. <laughs> what is happening in the current Israel right now? 
We know that again, they proudly adhere to the right to return of Jews from all over the world. The majority is dominated by Ashkenazi Jews, but there are others, European Jews. There are Sephardi Jews from Spain, Portugal, North Africa. There are Midrasi Jews who are basically, not Madras, but they are from basically the Middle East. There are Bukharan Jews from Central Asia. And also, not to forget, there are Bene Israel Jews, that means basically Jews from Africa, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and other places who are at the lowest of the income pile and they face racial discrimination. Apart from this, we forget 21% of Israel's population are Arab Israelis. And this, they basically effectively enjoy or suffer from a second class status. And even after this, this is one segmentation. After this, Israel is divided. It was founded on Zionism. But Zionism has two objectives. One is revision Zionism by Zawetsky. And over here, his one is basically very one flag uh, uh, Zionism. That means they call for Eres, greater Israel, where basically it encompasses for biblical Israel. And they include also parts of Syria and Jordan within their map. Another one is socialist uh, Zionism by Ben Gurion and basically the Labour Party that came in. And apart from this, what has come as a spoiler is the rise of the ultra-Orthodox Jews, who basically who we call the Haredis or Haredims. They basically constitute 13% of the population and they have basically 14, 18 seats in the Neset, the Israeli parliament. And these are basically East European Jews, ultra-Orthodox, who till 2017, they had no obligation to serve in the Israeli army. They had no obligation to work in the formal sector. They would be basically supported by government subsidy and handout. And this is this largely this ultra-Orthodox Jews who constitutes nearly 600,000 of the illegal uh, settlements that is happening in West Bank. Along with this, there's an income divide in Israel because these facts need to come out. In Israel, we think, oh, it's an OEC country, it's a very rich country, but there are caveats. The main drivers of Israel are two sectors. One is the tech sector, which basically employs 10% of the entire population of Israel's labor force, contributes to 15% of the GDP, and also produces 50% of exports in goods and services, high-tech services. And that's why they've started, just like Silicon Valley, Silicon Wadi. And this basically employs high-end, middle-class, secular Israelis. And there is also the army. But apart from this, the rest of Israel, if you look into the figures, 20% of Israel's population as a whole lives below the poverty line, national poverty line of $70. 50% of the Haredi Jews, ultra-Orthodox, they basically uh, live below the national poverty line. One third of Arab Israelis live below the poverty line. That is the economic background. When did this attack happen? This attack happened when Benjamin Netanyahu's government was facing popular disobedience. They tried to take on the Supreme Court and they wanted to basically, they wanted, what would I say, legislative control over judicial observations. Because till now, Israel doesn't have any constitution, just like the United Kingdom. So as a result, and there's a lot of similarity between the two, but the, in, in this case, what happened is the judiciary could intervene and overturn parliamentary legislations. But one of the things that the ultra-Orthodox party, whose uh, coalition that supports Binyamin Netanyahu thinks, is that it is staffed by liberal, socialist, or again, secular uh, Jews, and they are out to undermine the Haredi faith. They're forcing them to work. They're forcing them to serve in the army. They're preventing them from expanding into more land. And they're trying to go for concessions to the Palestinians. So what happened was the civil disobedience movement. For the first time, Israeli army soldiers were boycotting. Reservists were refusing to answer the call. The tech sector was on strike. And just like that, when the attack happened, all of Israel united for the time being. And while everyone's attention is focused on Gaza, you have 2.2 million people who are suffering over there. There are also rise of settler attacks in the West Bank 
and which is largely being ignored by the army and not reported in the media. I'm going by not by Facebook reports, by again, reports of economists or financial times. Now what happens? And now if we take into this, the Abrahamic Accord is all but dead because either the ambassador, either the four countries that have basically recognized Israel, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and I believe with those are the fourth, uh, Sudan. Now they have either downgraded the status or recalled the ambassadors. Saudi Arabia was on the cusp of a deal with USA and Israel. And even the Israeli tourism minister, minister was in Jeddah. And what they were asking was, Mohammed bin Faisal, who was basically admitted as much when he came out on TV, that we want a security guarantee from the United States. We need the right to basically acquire high-end security weapons, and we need to have independent oversight in terms of nuclear uranium enrichment. UAE had ceded that right. They wanted this. And Israel was the barter on this, or basically Israel would basically act as a facilitator. Now, even if Mohammed bin Salman wants it, he can't get it. And what has happened over here? Everybody thought that, again, the Iranians with their proxies, the Shia proxies, either the Houthis in Yemen or the Hezbollah in Lebanon or the Hamas over there, they had orchestrated the attack, but they hadn't. This was, again, but would Iran benefit from this? Of course. That is also, but then again, this is again the chaos that you've created. Apart from this, what else has happened? The Russia-Ukraine war. Again, the West's attention or America's attention has been diverted. Though they might say that, again, we will continue to support our European allies, but what has happened is, in an election year, if you, if you botch up on Israel, no presidential incumbent or no presidential challenger can hope to win. IPAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, it is very strong. Apart from this, what has happened? Egypt, which is on the brink of economic implosion, inflation rate 33%, Bread subsidy, now over there, which basically is the lifeblood of Egypt. Now that cannot be sustained. And CC has basically, the president of Egypt has basically <coughs> preponed the elections and he's taking it on 10th December. One of the things that he's afraid of, that despite pressure from Israel and the West, they don't want basically the refugees to come in or the displaced uh, Gazans to come in because there is clashes between the Bedouins and the Palestinians in Sinai. And they think if they come in, Iqwan al-Muslimin will be more strengthened. Apart from this, what else is happening? The economy from 1980 to 2002, again by again Israeli estimates, Palestinian uprisings have cost 3.5% of Israel's GDP. And if the war continues, their much vaunted tech sector, there will be mass exodus. So see, even in Israel's interest, they cannot, they have to basically come to terms, or just equitable terms. And this is also one of the problems because everybody thought the Palestinian problem is going to go away if you ignore it long enough. Let us sign Abrahamic Accord and the Palestinians will take care of themselves. But that hasn't happened. And by 2060, there will be 9.7 million Palestinians in occupied areas. How many will you kill? You have to come to a fair, equitable, and honorable uh, agreement. But even before that, even if you, if you discard this, whole of Middle East is in turmoil. China has come in. It had brokered an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. But that is more of a transactional agreement because for both countries, now China has become more important because it has become the largest fuel importers. China has become the largest trading partner of Saudi Arabia. And again, we always have that idea that Arabs are lazy. This is cultural stereotype. Again, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, they're moving to non-oil sector. Vision 2030 of Mohammed bin Salman, like him or hate him, he's moving to non-oil growth. And again, New York City, or again, uh, this is a huge industrial zone that he's building in. And also, they are also pioneering uh, production of EV cars, electronic vehicles. And that's why they are basically tying up technology. And that's why they were eager on basically securing greater collaboration with Israel. 
Apart from this, because of Saudi Arabia's rise, what has happened is now Saudi Arabia in the next 10 years will start competing with UAE because they are trying to sell the same products. And as a thought, in Iran also there will be turmoil because Ayatollah Khamenei is near mid 80s and there is no clear successor. Because many think that the current Iranian president might be drafted in as a president, Ibrahim Raisi, but he is standing as a, he is not an Ayatollah, he's a lowly cray. And the person who's the front runner is Imam Khomeini's son, who has been recently appointed Ayatollah. But the Iranian Revolutionary Guard basically controls more, more, and more power. And the Vilayat Faki system or the rule of the clergy can be even modified or remodeled. Last but not the least, because Africa, again, Middle East and North Africa is big, but there are countries who are not oil exporting countries, oil importing countries. And these countries are in severe economic distress. Egypt, Lebanon, <laughs> Tunisia. All of them are going for IMF negotiations. The pound, Egyptian pound, has been devalued thrice last year. And they have at least $30 billion of debt repayment next year. So there is a lot of inbred economic crisis and resentment on the pub, in the public street. Yes, what happens in Israel against the Palestinians do concern the Arabs, but they also have national issues. And one thing is also right. If we just look at an experiment that took place 1,000 years ago, when Pope Urban II called for the Crusades, similar pattern. Again, when you had basically mainly an European diaspora coming in and settling in the Outremer, as we call, basically roughly Israel, Palestine, modern day's time, survived for 200 years. But the inexorable march of time, basically the crusader states are basically a figment of distant uh, imagination and memory. It's no longer there. If Israel continues to operate on Western support, quote unquote American support, without basically recognizing the rights of the Palestinians, this problem will persist. And if this problem persists in the long run, no matter how many countries recognize you, you will not be able to triumph. Might is right up to a point in time. And that is something that we forget about Middle East time and again. Everybody thought that the Americans had retreated from the Middle East. They had to come scurrying back. History has been shaped by the Middle East. And the Middle East will continue to remain important for us. For us, 90% uh, of our expat workers, 75% of our expat workers are also in the Middle East. Our talks of economic diversification or foreign investment, also so the Middle East countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE are big players. So we also need to educate ourselves and train ourselves in what happens in the Middle East. And <laughs> instead of apportioning blame, we should need to look into the chain of events. And I would like to also add that whenever we basically say that Israel is wrong on many counts, but that doesn't mean that we will equate every Jew in the world with Israelis. Many Jews that I know oppose, again, the policies of Israel. The, one of the leading critics of Israel is Noam Chomsky, who is himself a Jew. So again, just because a Jew doesn't mean a Jew is a basically an ardent supporter of Zionism. It's a different issue. However, I think I'm okay. nearly over the time. The last thing that we would like to look into is that whether you believe in a two-state solution or a one-state solution where Palestinians and Israelis have equal rights, that will be determined not by conflict, not by international pressure, <coughs> but by the march of history. And history marches to its own tunes. Thank you. Professor, thank you very much for a very detailed presentation. And all I can say is that there is no military solution to the problem or the crisis. We have to find out a political solution to the crisis. And perhaps the best solution that we have at hand today is going for a two-state solution. Something that Israel has ignored for many years. But it is time the international community breaks up the issue again and look for a sustained solution to the crisis. 
I would now like to recognize the presence of the Ambassador of Palestine in Bangladesh. And Ambassador, I would like to give you the floor to give you, may I request you to limit it to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm really honored to be among you in this critical time that our people are facing. Uh, some of our colleagues and friends, uh, mainly from the United States, some from Europe, they don't, like, they don't like to talk about history. For us in the Middle East, we love history. Please. In Europe, <laughs> yeah. We like history because history is the basic of nations. Let me just go a little bit into history for some friends who maybe might know or not know. We lived for 2,700 years together in Palestine with the Jews and with the Christian as a Muslim. We never had any obstacle or any problem or any uh, civil war. It's the opposite. We together fought the invaders who invaded Palestine, like the Roman Empire, for example. We and the Jews and the Christian fought against the Roman. And we were living side by side. Cross marriage were there. Interaction was there. There was nothing called this area for Jews and this is for Muslim and that's for Christian. You will see in most of the villages and cities in Palestine, the mosque close to the church, close to the synagogue. And we really lived as brothers and sisters. Actually, in fact, one of my third cousin, not second cousin, third cousin, is married to a Jew. I'll tell you the story later. It's a very interesting one. So we had never any problem with them. So for people who try to say the problem is between, it's, it's a religious problem between Christian or Muslims and Jews, it's absolutely not true at all. Because we as a Muslim believe and respect all the Abrahamic religion, the Christian and the Jews. And that's what we believe in. And it's obligation for us as a Muslim, as stated in Surah Al-Baqarah, that we have to, we must believe, if we are a true believer, we must believe in all the secret or sacred or holy books, Torah, Bibles, and the Quran. And we must believe in all the prophets from Moses to Jesus to Muhammad and so on. So the problem came after something rise in Europe which called Zionism. And as Professor Abbasi mentioned, in, 19, in 1897 in Switzerland, in PAL, the first conference, the Zionist conference, who decided to establish a homeland for Jews in Palestine. 20 years later, there was the Belfort Declaration, the famous Belfort Declaration, which it's the main source of our misery today, is that declaration. If we go a little bit on the 11th, from 11th century, the history of the Jews in Europe in general was not a pleasant history. From most of the Europeans, which ended up in the dreadful Holocaust, which you all know about. But the Jews also faced difficulties in different places, not only in Nazi Germany. And this is what the European historian wrote, and we read from that. So the only place, in fact, was safe for the Jews that they lived in harmony was Palestine. But they were living as a Palestinian Jews, just like the Christian were living and still living as a Palestinian Christian and the Muslim as a Muslim Palestinian. But when they tried to shift drive us out, force us out of our country and take our land, our dignity, 
that everything we have, our identity, our existence as a human being, they took all that by force from us and they drove us out of our country in 1948. That's we call it catastrophe. And we call it catastrophe not because the Arab lost the war, because those people were displaced, about 960,000 people. At the time, Palestinian population were 1.5 million only. And you can imagine when you displace two thirds of the population by force outside their country and make them live as a refugee like myself. I was born a refugee and living a refugee and might die as a refugee. But I hope that will not happen to my children. Now the Palestinian after, uh, in 1965, they launched the revolution. Revolution not to liberate uh, the West Bank and Gaza Strip and Jerusalem, because it was in the hand of the Arabs. It wasn't in the hand of the Jews or the, 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 the Israeli. It's true. This was the time when we wanted to come back to our country, liberate our country. And the Israeli uh, uh, spread the rumors and the information or whatever to the Western world that they want to throw us in the sea. And this will be the second Holocaust. Well, the European and the American mainly, they did not need any excuse to support Israel. They already supported Israel from the partition when they take a decision to split Palestine in half and give 55% uh, to the 30% of the Jewish people in Palestine and give the 45% to the majority Muslim and Christian. I'm not going to bore you a lot with the history. I just wanted to give only a few examples. Israeli proven for the last 33 years since the Madrid conference in 1990, left, right, and center, they want the same thing. That is proven. The majority, I'm talking about the majority, one thing the greater Israel. But each part has presented their idea in a different manner. Netanyahu and his government was the most honest people to provide and present their idea openly. Not in a diplomatic way, not in a cheating way, but very frankly. The previous government, left, right, and center, they want to acquire as much geography of Palestine with less demography. They want the rest of the Palestinian people, the majority of the Palestinian people, to leave the country by putting extremely pressure on them, killing their children. I think yesterday most of you have seen on Al Jazeera English, and I have seen something horrific, really. A sniper shoot an eight-year-old boy in the head, in front of the camera. And then the other boy, 15 years old, was running away. Then they shot him on the chest. He fell down. He tried to move. They shot him again. And he died. It happened in front of the camera. The question I ask myself, if I was in the army and a sniper and somebody killed my entire family, believe me, I will never pull the trigger on an eight-year-old boy or a 15-year-old boy. So what is the difference between me and him? There is a problem here. And this problem should be identified. Many of the Israeli soldiers, they left the army and they spoke out. They told the truth, how they felt. 
They said that it's true that we are trying to humiliate the Palestinian, but then we discover we are humiliating ourselves. Those are the kind of people that we do respect. Obviously, it took them time to understand the truth, but finally they did. As uh, Professor Abbasi mentioned, over one million of the Jews not that they don't recognize the right for Israel to exist, but they recognize the full right of the Palestinian people to live in peace and in harmony. And some of those people believe, which I support that, in one state solution. Personally, not officially, I'm telling you, I do not personally believe in two-state solution. It will never happen. It will never happen, personally. Don't quote that. Because the history shows us the majority in Israel believe if we are establishing a, state, a Palestinian state, that is going to be the beginning of the end of Israel. People doesn't trust you. Who trusted the Palestinian, in fact, from the Jews? The Sephardim, not the Ashkenazi. And that is also another fact. The Middle Eastern Jews and not the uh, uh, European Jews, especially the East European Jews. Which, in fact, this is another story. Originally, they're not Jews, by the way. They converted to Judaism from Khazaria in the, in the 9th century. This is another story. Judaism, you cannot convert to Judaism. To Judaism, your mother should be Jewish. Even if your father is Jewish, you cannot, you have, your mother should be Jewish. This is the law. But they have converted in Khazaria, all of them, to Judaism. And then in the 12th century, after the Russian invaded this empire, they spread in all East European country. Those are the, they call them the 13th tribe. Because Jews are 12 tribes, they call them 13th tribe. This is no old history. We've not. Now, what do we want as a Palestinian? I'm not going to talk about the disaster, the genocide, the ethnic cleansing which took place in Palestine for the last 50 days. You all know, I'm sure you all know about it. You have seen it. And I'm sure if you didn't see it and somebody told you about it, you will not believe it. But it's happening in the 21st century. Killing of 8,000, ch the children who died is almost 8,000 or more. Because you have to know that we have over 6,000 people under the rubble. And it's been more than one month. So you don't expect anyone to be alive. So this should be added. 8,000 of our children, more than five or 6,000 women. This has a meaning. This directed to a certain direction that this army is not only coming against the resistance of Hamas or Jihad or whatever. No, they mean something else. They wanted to kill as much as possible so they can drive the rest of the population outside Gaza Strip, and that's what exactly they want. As I mentioned before, more geography, less demography. And this was from the first day when they called the Palestinian human animals, when the President of Israel said, all the people in Gaza are responsible for what happened on the 7th, and because they did not rebelled against Hamas, so they are responsible, and they deal with us as such. All the people in Gaza have hand on the 7th of October. But the 7th of October was not the beginning of the crisis. The 7th of October was an episode of this whole series. This started in 1917, when the British gave what doesn't belong to them to the Jewish people. 
we the Palestinian believe majority that the best solution is we live as Professor Abbasi one land one nation different religion equal rights democracy we accept to live with 5.6 million Jews. We have no problem with that. But they have to accept us that we are 15 million Palestinian around the world. We can live only in peace if it is one state solution. Names, we can agree on a name. But I'm sure they will not even accept the one state solution. If they don't accept two-state solution, how would they accept one-state solution? Because if you, it's a democracy, the majority will rule and run. And they're not the majority. So which method can we use in order to convince them that peace should prevail? If you want peace, you have to be just and you have to give the Palestinians their rights they turn that ear. Palestinian people have three choices. Three. Either they accept occupation, bow to the occupation, live with the occupation, and manage with the occupation, or pack their luggage and leave the country. And the third one is to resist. And resist in any way they can. Because the international law give you permission to resist occupation in all means, including armed struggle. So killing Israeli soldiers, it's not at all terrorism. Because all nations who were under occupation, they fought the occupying power. And only by armed struggle, they were able to achieve victory and liberation and dignity. So it's not like we like bloodsheds. No, we don't. None of us do. We hate killing. But when you leave us in a position that you're giving us no choice but to resist and to fight this occupation, which thanks to Netanyahu and his government, especially the three excellent ministers, the Minister of State Security being clear, Smosrich, I don't even like his name, uh, the Minister of uh, Finance, and there is another heritage minister who called to throw a nuclear bomb on Gaza. Yeah. They have successfully removed the mask from the face of Israel and showed the real face. This who we are. We don't mind killing children, women, pregnant women, elderly people, destroy hospitals, uh, uh, mosques, uh, uh, churches. Nothing is forbidden for them. International law for Israel does not even exist. It doesn't exist. It has, it has no, no words in the Israeli dictionary that an international believe that international law is for the powerful not for the weak is to support power not to support the right right of power it's the power of rights we just want peace believe me just peace nothing else we want to live in peace because enough is enough for both of us. But if they insist, believe me, the problem will continue. Bloodsheds will be more and more and more. Interna Just give me one minute about the international law and international community. If the international community want to solve the problem, they can solve it when 12 months time. How? They don't need to send tanks and fighter just and troops they don't have to sanction just the same way it's done in south africa exactly the same way if they really want to solve this problem 
Everybody says European countries, all the European countries, the American two-state solution. All right, fine. You've been saying that for 30 years. But what have you done to implement it? Nothing. You're standing blindly behind Israel and calling self-defense. Since when the occupying power have a self have a right for self-defense? It's the people under occupation have the self the right for self-defense and have the right to resist the occupation. So if the international community want, and when we talk about international community, we talk about the five permanent members of the Security Council mainly, and the other. You impose sanction on Israel, then you force Israel to accept two-state solution. This is the time when we will not have extremists in both sides. When you force us to live together in peace, we will obey. But force both of us, not only one part. And thank you all, and thanks for the great position of the people of Bangladesh. We are really proud of you very much, because what you have done is unprecedented. And it was from your heart. So I want to thank each and every citizen of this country for standing with the just cause of the Palestinian people. Standing with Palestine is standing with humanity. Thank you and a very good morning to you all. Thank you, Ambassador. That was a very sobering statement from your side and we are now better informed. I shall now open the floor for your questions and comments. Please be brief so that we can take in as many questions and comments as possible. Please raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Let me look around the hall first. All right. Admiral Lowell, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, to the panel, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the legal aspect because uh, the way the bombing is being done or the uh, operation is being done in Gaza, uh, serious questions are being raised about the international law, uh, particularly the international humanitarian law, law of armed conflict, Geneva Convention. Now, I did a course uh, in the United States. Uh, it is conducted under the Department of Justice and at the Naval Justice School. And the uh, course is on the conducting military operations in accordance with law. And that was just before 9-11. Uh, uh, I think uh, about 40 participants, bureaucrats, military, then uh, lawyers, technocrats, all sort of uh, people under a uh, simulated UN scenario. So there uh, we are given, uh, you know, uh, the detailed uh, ideas about the law governing the conflicts. So there are two principles which uh, transpired. So one is uh, just at Belam and another is just in Belam. Uh, just, uh, just at Belam, uh, that deals with the, for the states when it go to war, when it uh, can opt for uh, using the armed forces. And just at Belam, that's the principle when you were engaged in a war. So that comes the Gaza situation. There are two cardinal principles in just and Belam. That is law of discrimination, determining the military target specifically under the international law and the law of proportionality, where you use the uh, force, which is, please note, morally justified. That's the law of proportionality. So th these two uh, cardinal principles uh, under the international law of the just in Belem, where you have to specify the military target, not civilian, not uh, non-combatants, and uh, any uh, structure or any uh, people not connected with the military, not con contributing to the military effort. And proportionality, that has to be morality. And morality, uh, you know, it has to be, uh, Genghis Khan will have one morality and other humanitarian will have another morality. So in that context, uh, what happens now, uh, 
because uh, what Israel uh, describes that, uh, you know, uh, the hospital uh, is being used as, uh, uh, you know, uh, for military purpose. Uh, so uh, we can bomb it. And it seems that uh, international community has accepted it. And uh, it's openly uh, being done. The uh, places of worship, uh, a very ancient Greek, uh, you know, uh, uh, church that has been bombed and destroyed to the uh, ground. Uh, so these are the things uh, which is clearly defined that is not the uh, place to bomb. So what do you think? Uh, how uh, do the uh, you know legal aspect uh, take shape? Because war is not ending here. Uh, there are already uh, forty ongoing conflicts are in the world. So how that will affect that, uh, I would like to know. And uh, another thing... Uh, well, can we keep uh, it to one question, please? Because we will have to go to other people. Right. Just just one thing uh, to Dr. Ibtekar, is you have left it to the international community to solve it. Now, you lo look at the international community. UN, we have seen that it is paralyzed. Now, uh, talking about the global south, uh, that is uh, where we belong. Uh, the organizations are, uh, you know, African Union, uh, uh, then OIC, and uh, uh, what is called the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the BRICS. Now, BRICS has a, had a virtual summit uh, where uh, they, with the initiative of current chair, South Africa, you know, it has moved uh, uh, for a, a ceasefire thing. Uh, but uh, in the summit, uh, the... Uh, supposed to be the strongest voice, the India, the premier was not there, the foreign minister, he presented it. And then OIC took one month to convene a meeting and the outcome is just, uh, you know, just a condemnation, no uh, action. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, with the other organizations, it is going nowhere. So under the circumstances, as you say, that is left to the international community or international system. How do you think it is going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, just before <clears throat> saying what I would like to say, uh, you forgot amongst the organizations, the Arab League, which uh, should be one of the most directly concerned and which has been talking since decades, doing nothing. So. <laughs> you should include them also in your list. Anyway, um, I, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, say very quickly a few things. As one of the permanent members of the Security Council, um, I would like to um, praise um, the um, wisdom of my Palestinian colleagues for uh, some uh, part of what he said. Um, with which I, I could definitely agree completely. Um, and as a personal, uh, uh, on a personal tone, I think in an ideal world, uh, you're right, a one state solution would be the best. Uh, but we are not, we're not yet there anyway. So, <clears throat> uh, France has supported the Palestinian cause since so, so, so long. Uh, this is something that uh, we will never come uh, back uh, from. Uh, we, we, our unwavering support is here and will stay here. Um, now, what happened on the 7th of October could be considered an episode if you go back to uh, the history of Rom Roman Empire and the history of the Holy Land. Okay. But um, we are not bearing all this in mind in constantly. So no, it was not an episode. It was a terrible terrorist attack on civilians, not on soldiers. Uh, it was on civilians. Uh, and this, you have to understand the context uh, in Europe. I will limit myself to Europe. The context in Europe is that we have this terrible, terrible historical memory of what happened on European soil. And um, um, of course, there are still um, 
very large Jewish communities in some European countries. France <coughs> is host to the second largest Jewish community after the United States, as a diaspora, Israeli says, but it's a Jewish community. So um, this is something, of course, we have to protect, as well as we have to protect our very large Muslim community in France, which is, in comparison to the size of our population, the largest in Europe. Okay, then <clears throat> you cannot uh, say that uh, Alia uh, led to Nagba like this directly. Something happened in between. European imperialism. You can call it what, what you want. It was just a holocaust. It happened. You cannot re uh, summarize uh, the whole problem since 1948-1967 uh, uh, because of the existence of the Zionist ideology. Something happened in between, which is called Holocaust, and um, had consequences. Okay. So... <laughs> We are actively working, uh, the French president, French foreign minister, and other envoys. Uh, we are talking to many people. We have been going to China. We have been talking to the Chinese, acknowledging the uh, uh, mounting role of China in the region. That's absolutely true. Asking them, <clears throat> for example, to uh, use their uh, very good relations with Iran, for Iran to uh, ask, for example, the Houthis to stop um, creating problems for freedom of navigation in the regional uh, seas, and also maybe to pass some messages to Hezbollah in Lebanon, because we last thing we want to see is a regional escalation of this tragedy uh, in uh, Palestine and Israel. Uh, but we will see if Iran still has a lot of leverage on Hezbollah, because Hezbollah, after the death of uh, General Soleimani, became the most powerful proxy as such. So we'll, we'll see. But all this to say that we are actively working uh, for um, prolongation duality of the current truce, and uh, not only for the freedom of hostages, but also to allow all the humanitarian uh, support, be it health and, and all the rest. And of course, um, to make sure that the longer the truce stays, the more space can be given again to political negotiations, and what is currently on the table, even if it's dormant, is the two-state solution mechanisms for which everyone has tried its best effort in the last many years, and where at some points we were very close to uh, some very uh, breaking agreements, um, but you cannot blame only the Israelis for not having made the last move. There were also um, there were also um, um, regrettable uh, moves uh, which were made by Palestinian side, not ready to accept some last concessions, which eventually could have brought uh, some solution. Anyway, I'm thinking of TABA uh, negotiations in particular. So we are actively working for this. We, we even uh, issued a statement on 27th November, a few days ago, uh, actually three, three days ago, um, calling on the cessation of settlements which are again actively going on in the West Bank. And this is something that we cannot accept 
And this is something that we all, all, all of us Europeans are absolutely united to be, uh, to, uh, to make our voice, uh, against it. So we would, of course, uh, like, uh, the discussions in the Security Council to, uh, go, uh, to a better direction, uh, but reality is what it is. Uh, but I think hopefully, hopefully, um, the situation, uh, in the Security Council will eventually move in the good direction. That's what we hope. And that's what we're trying to, uh, to work for. And I will stop here because otherwise it will be too long. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think the primary objective now is to extend the humanitarian truce and provide humanitarian assistance to the people in Gaza. So that's the way things are moving now, and I hope the extension does work. Uh, we'll now go to Group Captain Zahid for your question. Please be brief. A question rather than a comment. And it's interesting uh, that uh, a lot has been talked about. Uh, the topic also uh, says about understanding implications. So my affiliation is uh, to American International University and also University of Reading, where I am uh, currently uh, work as an um, academic advisor as well. Uh, but I'm also required to make a disclaimer. Uh, my comments here is entirely from my uh, position as, in, uh, as a reader of geopolitics and uh, as an independent researcher. Uh, I'm also shackled by the fact that as a shivering scholar, one of our 2005 Shivan scholar was killed in Gaza on a bombing on 5th and I sympathize much with the uh, with the Palestinian ambassador here and the high commissioner here about the uh, real thing in, uh, on ground. I'm also privileged to have a friend uh, who works now in King's College, Offer Friedman, who's an Israeli, a Jewish, a Jewish Jew and a very brilliant writer, uh, so uh, a brilliant author. But that aside, I will focus on the implications with an Olympian detachment, which probably is was missing in the discussion, which is much which was which almost revolved around history. The Kirk, the, Kirk, so, uh, the, the, the curse of history is that we often try to recreate the past, forgetting what is likely to be in the future. Uh, that is the curse of the history. Exactly what the ambassador was saying, 30 years after Oslo, we had a prime minister holding a map in the United Nations Secur uh, General Assembly, which has obliterated all the uh, past instruments that has been built. And again, today you have again obliterated the two-state solution, which in my uh, own reading of understanding of the topics is the only instrument to go forward. But the good part of it is that if there is a one state solution that would probably not require international support, that would be an internal process. But I would uh, qualify the word which has been often used by some of these uh, panelists today here, two state solution. It needs to be qualified with the word, if it is taken as a project, irreversible course of two state solution. We have been there, the talks about two-state solution was there, but it was reversible. It was stalled. It was bracketed. But it has to be irreversible two-state solution as one of the things that the ambassador has said. It can be armed with sanctions if somebody does not follow certain provisions of that two-state solutions and it will automatically trigger. So this is the thing that I was thinking uh, that would come out from the discussion. But furthermore, to our context, what does it mean for Bangladesh and South Asia, China, and the geopolitics of this region in, in, uh, in particular. First, I think, which the uh, ambassador, European Union ambassador has also said, Europe has been very, uh, very forthcoming in, uh, in enlightenment, and America recently has been uh, promoting a value-based diplomacy. What this crisis shows is that this is likely to dilute the value-based diplomacy that the Americans or the West-led uh, uh, foreign policies now trying to create a new international order. 
And that is, the, that, is, that is where the West needs to focus because they also have an internal push from the universities to the um, uh, big uh, processions, which is pressuring their government to sort of change their approach towards Israel. So the value-based diplomacy of the West is likely to take the first battering of this incident, which I still consider uh, that is a symptom, it's not the cause. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, the Hamas attack was a symptom, it is not the cause of the whole thing. The second important thing is about China, which is so far has been committed very positive in terms of speech act, not the real act. And that I'm saying is that this is a battle of wrestling who is going to be the leader of the global south. I, I hear the word somebody said global south. There is underneath that word, there is a big struggle, big contestation between China and India to be the leader of the global south. I think uh, India's position on this issue is likely to dilute its claim. Look, uh, look, uh, look around the South American countries, Bolivia has withdrawn its uh, ambassador, uh, Brazil has also uh, shifted its embassy. South Africa is uh, very vocal about this. So there is a global south pressure which is coming uh, around this to make a more viable uh, solution to the problem. So, and the third thing that I would uh, probably uh, highlight is here is uh, in the context of Bangladesh, uh, we are facing a sort of, a, I would say, mm, uh, we are in the middle of a value-based diplomacy extension armed with certain instruments, which is national in nature, but applied as a global governance tools like the uh, sanctions and others. So uh, this is going to be tested through this method that how uh, that instrument continues to work or uh, whether there is a critical mass around the global south who would reject or try ask to be more sort of uh, genuine in their approach. Of course, there are internal dynamics and internal politics into it, but that would be the lesson and, and a critical area. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Zayed. Jill Zahir. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I want to just um, comment and also uh, highlight three issues. Number one, uh, we all used to know that European Union and Europe as a whole uh, has been the champion of human rights, uh, a champion and also somewhat custodian of um, human rights, rule of law, democracy, etc., etc. And they have worked a lot on laws of war and other issues related to this. But uh, unfortunately, the last few years, we see that the character of the European Union has changed dr drastically. They are now off course on these issues, as we have seen uh, in case of Ukraine and also now in case of uh, Palestine, and especially in the wake of uh, this event that took place on 7th October. Uh, except for Ireland, no European country has come out with a strong voice uh, pointing out uh, the violation of international law and laws of war that is happening in Gaza. Why is it so? I want a response uh, from, from somebody who represent here from European Union. Why have they deviated from this path? Number two, I have a serious question to us, the Muslim community, the Arab League, and why is it? What have they done when occupations were taking place, ethnic cleansing was taking place in West Bank, the raids were illegal, raids were taking place in West Bank, and the two-state solution was put in the back burner. I found that YC and Arab leagues have not raised any what, what worthwhile voice, and it was as if they were, ex they were accept expect sorry, accepting this illegal settlements, making light noises. And uh, when the Abrahamic Accord was presented, many of the Middle Eastern countries jumped into it without any preconditions. 
at least they could have given two preconditions that one that respect for human rights stopping illegal settlement in west bank and also this incursion into the alaska mosque that was continuing and if we forget that hamas reaction and the namely as operation alaska flood and and yc had been ignoring and even if when it was happening the last meeting of yc they could not really come to a, a sort of common uh, sort of response so i would ask again somebody representing yc here to respond so what is wrong with us what is wrong with us why can't we set a what why can't we set a red line why couldn't we unite and say that when the enough is enough if you cross this we don't care about the west we we have to really do something and 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 because we can watch and remain stand by like this so i would ask this response from yc somebody the thirdly i think one state solution is no more practical i agree with the uh, ambassador of palestine here and some others but what is the alternative solution uh, uh, one state solution is the alternative solution but i think that will also not work but i have a proposition i i have a proposition uh, which is more practical i think and and i floored this uh, idea here that it is a confederating two entity one state solution is a confederating two entity one state solution that means it will be confederation of the palestinians and the israelis they will one central government with two independent entity with with certain degree of sovereignty living side by side in harmony with equal rights i i don't believe there will be ever equal rights but near equal rights near equal rights and so that this problem can be resolved for once for all i think two state solution one state solution as stated now will not work a confederating two state two entity confederation i think it will be way forward your response from especially from the panel please okay thank you thank you i the ambassador okay just one minute ambassador can i can I, yeah okay can i have the microphone here with the ambassador both the ambassadors want to go very quick um um i think <clears throat> if you didn't hear um our voice the voice of france uh calling very strongly for the respect and implementation of human inter humanitarian international law uh it might be um and unfortunately it would not be surprising it might be because you uh are a victim of the uh flood tofan of disinformation uh which is going on all the time but especially massively since the 7th of october so <clears throat> france uh, made its voice known very loud about this and other issues and of course we were not the only one uh, in uh, in europe to uh, to call for this but of course um, mr macron's uh, voice and stance uh, might be uh, maybe a little bit more Uh, known and outstanding than ever as you should have heard him i will make sure that correct information gets to your inbox uh whenever it's necessary that's the only thing i wanted to say thank you ambassador um a counter question to zahir if you have a confederation under one state what is the level of franchise it is one person one vote if that is the question it is a non starter that's a problem anyway we, uh, let's not discuss here we will have one minute with the palestinian ambassador and we go back to the panel can i have the microphone here please yeah it's okay okay yeah i just have uh, small things to correct my good friend maria in the year 2000 when uh, president clinton he called yasser arafat and uh, barack 
the Israeli Prime Minister to the to Camp David. Right? That was the closest time, if you mean that. That's why there is a difference between our culture and your culture, and this gap makes a problem. I'll tell you the problem. For the Palestinian in general, or in particular, and for the Muslim world in general, there is nothing more precious than a city called Jerusalem. Jerusalem, because it is, uh, yes, but because it is the first Qibla of Islam was Al-Aqsa Mosque. So when, when uh, the general, ex-general prime minister of Israel at that time, I think Yehud Barak, he gave the Palestinian to the most of all the Israeli prime ministers which is close to 92% of the 1967 war, but not Jerusalem. And that was the obstacle. This is the wheel. Jerusalem is the wheel of this machine. Without the wheel, the machine cannot run. This should be understood for the whole world. Jerusalem, there is no compromise. It's a red line. And that's why Yasser Arafat turned the deal off. And any Palestinian in the future, any leader, will always do the same. It means a lot for us. For the 7th of October, Maria, please uh, just allow me. I was hurt as much as anyone else on the first and second and third day, when I heard from the Western media, mainly CNN and BBC, that those Palestinians who entered this area or attacked this area, they killed civilians, they killed babies, and they burned people. I was hurt, believe me, as much as anyone. I'm a human being, I have children also. But then, the news came from the Israeli themselves in Haaretz, which says totally different story. And this continue, this has continued till the last three days ago when they came with the proof that it was the Israeli Apache was shooting on everybody moves in that area including the Israeli civilians. You have seen the destruction which took place in the kibbutz, in the Israeli kibbutz, the destruction. The destruction will require, as the military people here understand, will require rockets, really heavy rockets to destroy houses. Not an AK-47 can do that. And one of the Israeli officers said that I have received instruction that wherever you find those terrorists, destroy it, destroy that position. And tanks were ordered to fire on those kibbutz where everybody dies. Nobody was burned, no child was beheaded. It all was false, it was a lies. It was just to draw the attention of the world. And Mr. Netanyahu told his soldier, today we have an unprecedented support from the world. So go ahead. And they went ahead and they killed over 20,000 Palestinians. That's why I said the blind backing of Israel gave the Israeli license to kill. And they used the license very well. So nobody can tell us that the Palestinians rejected the peace. We did not reject the peace at all. We wanted the peace and we were clear. 4th of June, 1967. And ladies and gentlemen, you should understand. The 1967 border, what we're talking about, is only 22% of Palestine, historical Palestine. We accepted the 22% for us and 78% for them. And yet, they want to take Jerusalem, which is the, the, the what do you call it, the, 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 the heart of, 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 of Palestine. 
It will always be the heart. A body without heart cannot survive. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We will now go back to the panelists. No, no more questions. No. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> just on the uh, 7th October make off uh, the story uh, make off of the story I'm sorry I will strongly strongly uh, repeat my call to everybody to make sure they are not victims of info operations on social media I don't agree at all with what you said on what was what happened on 7th October. This information is full speed. You should all be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going back to our panelists for them to respond. And each of you will have only three minutes because I will sharply finish it at <laughs> one o'clock. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Th thank you so much. I mean, this, uh, as I have said, that any discussion on on Palestine, uh, any deliberation in Palestine is always a passionate one, and this has been no different. The interesting thing is this, we have done it at two levels. This has been a combination of a, both a diplomatic and an academic in exchange. I, I want to recognize the contributions made by the two ambassadors. We're very grateful that you come to, uh, to our uh, deliberations. You enrich us with the tremendous information and analysis you give. You, sir, you have laid down the history uh, very well, perhaps. Very, you have made a very passionate plea uh, for your cause, which have not fallen on deaf ears here. And you, uh, ambassador, you have uh, very strongly and uh, presented the position that uh, uh, contrary to many of the views uh, that uh, that have been obtained from, as you say, the media, the farm that, uh, that have, uh, have come to us, you have stood uh, and ex explained to us that really the position of, of the European uh, European Union in general and France in particular. Uh, I want to place and record the appreciation of uh, of your con France's contribution to the uh, entire effort. The, as I prepared for this event, I followed all the uh, discussions uh, where President Macron was involved in and the pleas he made for others to come together for the ceasefire. And I have followed in the United Nations and the Security Council many, many debates, not just on Palestine, on Iraq, for instance, where I was physically present when France made tremendous contribution. Anyway, with regard to the academic side of, uh, of the de de debate, Awal, uh, 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 Admiral Lawal had, had a question directly addressed to me with regard to uh, how, uh, I mean, of course, he went into the techniques, uh, legal this thing of how war fighting is to be conducted, and thereafter asked what we can do with regard to uh, how we could inter, uh, 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 internationalize the response response to the to the issue. In other words, bring the international community to play a role. Uh, you would have noticed that when I suggested the R2P, it was, a, as I said, merely an idea, but this idea involves what you are saying. You also underscored that when you said talked of sanctions. And I've said the res responsibility to protect does not mean an automatic military response on the part of the United Nations. This response could be spread across very broad forum. Uh, it could begin with diplomatic negotiations and ultimately go to the sanctions that, that you have suggested as, as operations. Whether it will succeed or not, that is another another question. Now, in, in these international efforts, what happens is you we go from step to step to step. At some point in time, the, uh, the, uh, the self-interest of a critical player in the global community, which is one of the members of the P5, uh, is affected and therefore the uh, the uh, uh, the hammer comes down and the the process ends there that is a tremendous problem we find in the united nations system when we respond to crises li like this for instance in the in, in the security council uh, there is hardly any occasion on volatile situations where china russia and the european uh, 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 European members and the United States would get together on any issue like that. Therefore, the attempt, the attempt of the R2P is, if possibly possible, to 
uh, to uh, address it at levels lower than the Security Council. If we go for humanitarian uh, responses, perhaps we do not involve the Security Council uh, in, in the politico, political strategic sense. And there are efforts that can be made in that, that direction. Uh, we, we've been trying for years on end. The reason why, why we have not been succeeding because it's not easy. It's, it's, it's difficult. Um, uh, Zahid uh, and General Zahir, of course, made uh, in, in, in very interesting uh, uh, suggestions, uh, proposals. Uh, 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 Zahid's thing about the value-laden uh, uh, application of American diplomacy at this point in time. Yes, it's extremely important for America uh, to, uh, to register, register its impact on uh, on all uh, impact all over the world in a in a dispassionate way, but of course on this specific issue there is, as we know, a problem in the United States in terms of its domestic politics. But efforts are being made. Efforts are being made by all sides, uh, current actors, uh, former actors. I mentioned President uh, Carter uh, to emphasize and underscore the need to. To, uh, to inform American uh, positions with, with, uh, with the values on which they are currently laying stress, like human, hu human rights, etc. Anyway, I've taken up my three minutes, but I just want to thank everyone for the attendance, and it has been tremendous, tremendous contribution uh, to, to, uh, to the subject. There is no end to it, of course, but it has been, uh, we have taken this forward intellectually to, to an extent that I did not think would happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll be, I'll use up all my three minutes. First of all, again, there is no disagreement with, again, the issues that have been raised. Each one is speaking from their own perspective, and I think we're all beneficiaries of the French Revolution, where, again, the right to disagree with each other, we are also are basically beneficiaries of that great revolution. Again, the idea is very simple, and I'll answer one or two questions. And, and I know that, again, I don't live in Mount Olympus. I believe Zeus lived. I'm an ordinary Bangladeshi, so as it is. So I will speak from the humble ground. Uh, first, <laughs> the first issue is that, again, even within the Balfour Agreement, one proviso was there, which is not mentioned, that the right to repatriation of Jews to the Holy Land will be there as long as it does not infringe on the existing rights of the settlers who were already there. That's not mentioned. Number two, again, why do I say European imperialism? Because see, in history, you can't blame anyone. It is, again, we also have to dwell on the past, but also, uh, also living in the present, looking at the future. Conference of San Remo, where they decided to dismember the Ottoman Empire. And again, the British mandate that took over. And again, basically, America inherited the British mess. And you, despite the best of intentions, President Truman gave the recognition. Now, again, we won't go into this. And even Eisenhower, President Eisenhower was the most even-handed during the 1956 Anglo-French adventure or misadventure in the Suez when they basically called it off. The point remains, and there's only two. You will never have, yes, value-based democracy, or value-based uh, foreign policy is fantastic, but it is always backed up by raw power. We could learn, or at least the Palestinians, why are the Arabs not, and it's a very valid question, why are the Arabs not cooperating with the Palestinians? Because every country is pushing for their own national interest. The Saudis have basically detached from the, the Palestinians. UAE has done so. Turkey has been intermittently basically flirting. At one time, stoking up pro-Palestinian issues and then covertly, uh, basically collaborating with Mossad. That is there. And there are almost many of the Muslim countries are lining up with the Abraham Accord, they just need to get the public opinion on place. The Palestinians can only help themselves. In the, in the eventuality over there, if their cause is right, and they can take a leaf from Anwar Sadat's exercise. He dictated peace with Israel after basically a war which ended in parity. Whatever the outcome, and this is one of the outcomes. And again, what we, if the Palestinian cause is just, it will triumph in the end. And I must add, just one minute, sir. Again, any criticism of Israel doesn't mean that we are not sympathetic to a Holocaust. This was a mark on the human civilization, it's a stigma. But 
criticism of Israel is not criticism of the Jewish faith. That must be made completely clear. And France itself has been a leading cha champion in drawing basically parity between Israel and Palestine. And remember, this was the country where you had the Emil Dreyfus affair and where you had Emil Zola coming up with Jacques Hughes. So again, France has, a, again, it has, it admits to its mistake and the Nordic countries, they shepherded the Oslo Accords. So again, European Union has more nuanced understanding. Unfortunately, it hasn't traction until Russia and America come in. And those of us who are very worried about Palestinians being killed or Muslims being killed. However, the same sentiments we do not apply when we hear of allegations of uh, human rights abuse of Muslim citizens in China. So again, uh, we are, these are questions that we need to ask ourselves. I'm not saying if it's true or false. So every country pursues its own national interest and they will use the Palestinian issue as a prop when convenient. So even within the Arab world, there are fissures. But the Palestinians also, it's not the Muslim world. There have been attacks of Jewish settlers on even Christian pilgrims during the Church of Nativity or visits. So as a result, what happens over here, Hanan Ashravi was a Christian. Yasser Arafat's wife was a Christian. So the Arab Palestinian is a different composite multicultural identity. So again, there are multiple lenses. And unfortunately, divest and boycott of Israel won't happen. That won't happen unless it is backed by might. And that might, unfortunately, even if the heart is in the right place, real politics rules for the time being. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pervis. Dr. Choudhury, you want 10 seconds before you end? Yeah, ju ju so you have just, just a footnote to give some information that was that never came up in our discussions. In, in Herzl's uh, uh, suggestions of locations One for was in East Africa the, the recent, yes. Apart from Palestine, the other was Argentina. So, <laughs> goodness knows what would have happened if, if, uh, if the uh, settlement was made in Argentina. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, for the information. It's been a very rich discussion and we have all benefited on an issue which is very emotive in any place. And I'm happy that we discussed this in a matured manner. And a lot of information has come out. We will not summarize anything, not add any more discussion at the conclusion. All I would like to say that we sympathize with the killing and the suffering on both sides. We in Bangladesh stand solidly with our brothers in Palestine for the just cause, for the cause of humanity. And we in the international community will continue to support any moves that brings lasting peace to this troubled land. With that hope, I would like to end, and I would like, want you to please join me in thanking our panelists today and the two ambassadors who made their remarks. <laughs> May I now request you to join us for some refreshment outside. Thank you.